Well, we're in lesson 26. That means we're wrapping up the study rather quickly. We've just made it through the longest book of the Bible in just two weeks. What a great study this has turned out to be, and what great timing of this study uh, as we have just celebrated uh, Resurrection Sunday. You know, as uh, we look through this message, God's patience had worn out. He was done. He had waited long enough. He had pursued his people throughout our uh, the, throughout these 900 years since they've made the, co uh, the Mosaic Covenant uh, when they came out of Egypt. And Israel had already been taken away, and now Judah would be exiled uh, by Babylon. But, you know, among all these, these, these pages and pages of judgment, there are these tremendous uh, words of hope that God has always laced through his message. And in Jeremiah 31 through 33, we read that the, about this new covenant and this new covenant um, that he was bringing at, and that we just, again, we just celebrated. And this covenant covenant is the uh, the doctrine for this week's message. And I couldn't have think, uh, you know, as I went through this, it was like so perfect as it ended on uh, Easter Sunday. So as we uh, step in through these words, we need to remember, and that's one of the things God always told his people is to remember, 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 remember. And we need to remember that uh, of what Jesus Christ did for us. For us. But you know the beauty of uh, what he has done for us is now the law is written on our hearts and minds. And through Jesus Christ and through belief in, belief in him as our Lord and Savior, we are adopted into God's family. What a, what a blessing that is. I hope you've enjoyed uh, the discussion group with your men this evening. And uh, tonight we're going to hear from Dr. Uh, David Talley. He is, uh, we've heard from him before, and I thought uh, his message was uh, so appropriate. So uh, you get to listen to him tonight instead of me. So enjoy the message that uh, Dr. Talley has for us, and uh, we'll see you next week. As we open our Bibles toward the end of the book of Jeremiah, we get a picture of God that will lead us to worship and inspire a deeper wonder of his greatness and goodness. The focus of this lesson is Jeremiah chapter 33 and chapters 46 through 52. Because of the content of these chapters, I want to begin with chapters 46 to 52 and then finish with chapter 33. In chapters 46 to 52, we have prophetic messages offered to nine foreign countries, with the last one to Babylon being the longest. The section ends with the destruction of Jerusalem in chapter 52. This same account is found back in 2 Kings chapter 24, verses 18 through 30. There are only two slight differences in the two accounts. First, Chapter 52 omits the assassination of Gedaliah, which is recorded in 2 Kings chapter 25, verses 22 through 26. And second, chapter 52, verses 28 to 30, includes the addition of the number of people taken in deportation. We have no record of a prophet actually going to a nation to deliver a prophetic message from the Lord except for Jonah who was sent to Nineveh in a book that is mostly about the prophet himself rather than about his prophetic message. Even so, most prophetic books contain a prophetic message for a foreign country, and Jeremiah is no exception. He delivers prophetic messages directed at Egypt, Philistia, Moab, Ammon, Edom, Damascus, Kedar, and Hazor together, Elam, and Babylon. For each nation, there are usually named sins with the commonality being the sin of pride. The prophecies to these nations take up a good portion of the book, yet they are generally of little interest to the average student of the Bible. If prophetic literature is uninteresting to most Christians, then this is especially true for any of the messages directed to nations outside of Israel. So why would the prophecy, or any prophecy for that matter, include prophetic words intended for another nation? 
Why would God see this as important to include in his written revelation to Israel or to us? Let's take Israel first. Why is this important for them? Anytime God communicates a message of judgment to nations outside of Israel, they are usually one of Israel's enemies. This, of course, would bring much delight to Israel. They wanted to see God bring destruction on their enemies. They were sinners. They deserved to receive their just punishment. With this clear understanding of justice of punishment for sin, God turns the table on the Israelites. As he outlines their own sin, Israel finds that they will not escape his judgment. All of this teaches very clearly that God's justice requires the punishment of sin. Because he exercises his judgment to these nations, it is not vindictive. It is who God is. And because he exercises his judgment toward Israel as well, God is not one who shows partiality. Again, God's justice requires the punishment of sin, regardless of who commits it. He is not vindictive and he does not show partiality. Now, how about for us? Why are prophecies to nations outside of Israel important for us? Why should they matter? First, as we pay attention to these prophecies, seeking to learn from them, we are confronted with the universal sovereignty of God. His moral laws are not just for his people alone. He is not simply an option. He is the standard of morality from which the actions of all humanity are measured. The hymn embedded in the Oracle to Babylon is worth noting at this point. In chapter 51, verses 15 through 19, it states, He made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. When he thunders, the waters in the heavens roar. He makes clouds rise from the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with the rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. Every man is senseless and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is shamed by his idols. His images are a fraud. They have no breath in them. They are worthless, the objects of mockery. When their judgment comes, they will perish. He who is the portion of Jacob is not like these, for he is the maker of all things, including the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord Almighty is his name. Yes, he is sovereign over the entire creation. Second, these prophecies to other nations also reveal how one nation can be used as an instrument of judgment against another nation. God raises up nations, and he takes them down. He raises them up for his purposes to be accomplished through them. We do not know why he chooses one nation over another. We do not know why he chose the Assyrians to take down the northern kingdom of Israel or why he chose the Babylonians to take down the southern kingdom of Judah. It is his prerogative, and as such, no nation should pridefully look at their strength and power apart from giving glory to the Lord. It is a work that he does. And third, the occasional hope that is embedded in these prophecies to other nations demonstrates for us that God cares for them as well. He might not be doing his primary work through them as a nation, but he cares for the people. They are not useless bystanders to the important work that God is doing. They are human beings in need of a savior, so God moves toward them as well with kindness. In our present oracles to the nations, we have four instances of God's kindness being demonstrated. In chapter 46, verse 26, we learn that after receiving her judgment for sins, Egypt will be inhabited as in times past, declares the Lord. In chapter 48, verse 47, the Lord promises, yet I will restore the fortunes of Moab in days to come. In chapter 49, verse six, the Lord promises the same for the Ammonites, yet afterward, I will restore the fortunes of the Ammonites. And finally, in chapter 49, verse 39, Elam receives the same message of hope. 
God is not only a just God, he is also a good God. It is just who he is. The overall point of these prophecies for the other nations is that God is the God of the nations. Every person in this world is under his sovereign oversight and care. All creation is accountable to him. Reading through these prophecies should lead us to pray for the nations of the world. They all belong to the Lord. They all need the Lord. The Lord is moving toward them with the goal of redeeming them and bringing them into his kingdom. May the Lord move in the nations. May we be prayer warriors on their behalf, even as we rejoice over the sovereignty, justice, and goodness of the Lord on their behalf and on ours. Again, the point would be that the justice of the Lord does not show partiality. If Judah turns away from the Lord in rebellion, she also will receive judgment from the hand of the Lord. So the prophecy turns its attention to God's own people. The book of Lamentations is a perfect addendum to this chapter. Jeremiah chapter 52 describes the event of the fall of Jerusalem and the book of Lamentations provides the lament over this event. It is a sad day, but one that the Lord had patiently delayed for a long time. The evil of the nation precipitated this day. The Lord had been patient, overly patient. The Lord had been gracious, overly gracious. The Lord had warned, overly warned. And now the day comes with swiftness and totality. The chapter outlines the tragedy. At the end of chapter 52, there is what might seem a little odd, a count of the release of Jehoiakim. In chapter 52, verses 31 to 34, we learn that the king of Babylon releases him from prison, speaks kindly to him, and gives him a seat of honor higher than those of the other kings who were with him in Babylon. In one sense, this is an unexpected ending to the book. In another sense, it is very appropriate. This short scene would communicate hope to a nation that had lost everything. As they heard the news that King Jehoiakim was freed, so the nation could also anticipate the possibility of their own release. If God could do this for King Jehoiakim, then perhaps he could do it for the nation. And if Jeremiah's words could reach their ears, he mentions that the exile will be for 70 years in two different prophecies. The first is a prophecy that was given in the same year that Daniel was taken from Judah to Babylon in 605 BC. In Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 11 and 12, Jeremiah writes, the whole country will become a desolate wasteland and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation and the Babylonians for their guilt, declares the Lord, and will make it desolate forever. The second prophecy, which refers to the 70-year exile, was part of a letter that Jeremiah sent to Babylon about eight years later in 597 BC. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 10 and 11, Jeremiah writes, this is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. At least we know that Daniel had access to this prophecy because of what he reveals in Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. We can conclude from this that the message was spreading and hope was available to those who looked to the Lord. And there is even more. With this short account of King Jehoiakim, a descendant of King David is still alive as promised throughout the Old Testament. 
with this one key fact, we can go all the way back to the promised seed, the deliverer of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, which is carried forward to Abraham and his descendants, which is carried forward to King David, who is promised a forever throne, and which is now carried forward to the end of this short scene at the end of Jeremiah. The deliverer is still on his way. The descendant of Abraham who will come, bringing blessings to Israel and to all the nations, is still on his way. The king who will forever sit on the throne is still on his way. Jeremiah had even focused on this throughout his prophecy in chapter 25, verses 5 and 6. In chapter 30, verses 8, 9, and 21. In chapter 33, verses 14 through 17. Each passage offers a glimpse of the coming seed through King David's line. Can you feel the excitement? Despite all the sinful rebellion of the nation, the coup attempts taking out king after king and God's people being removed from the land, the promised seed, the deliverer, is still on his way. Glory be to the Lord. His redemptive plan cannot be stopped. We ourselves should draw hope from this short story at the end of Jeremiah. Now let's focus our attention on chapter 33. This chapter focuses on the restoration of the nation. Judgment for the nation is inescapable. In fact, they are already in the midst of it. Even the reforms of King Josiah were not enough to turn the nation back to wholehearted devotion to the Lord. Yet unbelievably, the Lord promises to restore the nation. The entire chapter is filled with the theme of restoration, but listen closely to the words of verses 6 through 9. Nevertheless, I will bring health and healing to it. I will heal my people and let them enjoy abundant peace and security. I will bring Judah and Israel back from captivity and will rebuild them as they were before. I will cleanse them from all the sin they have committed against me and will forgive all their sins of rebellion against me. Then this city will bring me renown, joy, praise, and honor before all the nations on earth that hear of all the good things that I do for it. And they will be in awe and will tremble at the abundant prosperity and peace I provide for it. Wow, the Lord has a future for Israel and the Lord has a future for us. We learn from the history of Israel that it is the Lord who has to step in and bring about a glorious future. Humanity constantly runs away, but the Lord runs toward. Humanity closes every opportunity, yet the Lord makes a way. Let's face it, none of us are going to get it all together. The church will always evidence sinful behaviors. We will continue to sin and be sinned against. So, do we give up? No, we continue to press on in the fear of the Lord. We might be sloppy in our living, but keep this one thing in mind. It is not the perfection of our heart. It is the direction of our heart. Keep your heart pointed toward the Lord. We have the same confidence as Paul in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. May this motivate us to move toward him and receive his kindness. May this move deeply in our hearts and grow an increasing love for him. Hallelujah, what a God, what a Savior.